Okay, so I wanted to have a look at chapter 7b, which is called Algebraic Methods, and 7b is really just focusing on proof here. Um, I'm going to put proof by contradiction, which is an A2 topic. Um, I'm going to put that in a separate playlist, but really you should see these proofs as all sitting together as one topic. So we've got three different types of proof, which is proof by deduction, proof by exhaustion, and proof by contradiction. And then we've got one type of disproof question, which is disproof by counterexample. And we're going to break them down one by one. So first of all, we have proof by deduction, and it says here that this is the simplest type, where you start from known facts and reach the desired conclusion via deductive steps. You may hear people say something like deduce the answer. It means kind of work out. So here it says prove that the product of two odd numbers is odd. There's a few different ways that you can do this, but I think perhaps the best way is to use an algebraic approach that we have. So it doesn't say any, sorry, it doesn't say two consecutive odd numbers, it says any two odd numbers. So I'm going to say let one of our odd numbers be 2m plus 1. And I'm going to let one of our odd numbers be 2 minus 1, and the other be 2n plus 1, where m and n are integers. Now, just quickly think about why that works for a second. If you take an integer and you multiply it by 2, you would get an even number. And then if you add on 1, you would get an odd number. So it guarantees that 2m plus 1 and 2n plus 1 are integers. Now, this little phrase that I've got here and this bit where it says let one of our odd numbers be, they're not necessarily strictly needed for the uh, mark schemes. However, I think if you're going to be doing maths at university, you do need to be getting into the habit of writing these things more formally. All they really need to see is that you've got these two odd numbers like this. OK, so product means the um, these two numbers multiplied together. So I'm now going to take 2m plus 1 and 2n plus 1, and I'm going to expand the brackets to get 4mn plus 2m plus 2n plus 1. And if I want to show that it's an odd number, I'm going to take a factor of 2 out of these bits here, and then I've got this extra bit left over. So if I take out a factor of 2, I would have 2mn plus m plus n plus 1. Now in the mark schemes, this is enough to say the product of two odd numbers has been shown to be odd. But I just want to break down why that's true. Well, if you think about it, this thing that we have inside here is an integer. And then what you're doing to that integer is you're multiplying it by 2 to get an even number and adding 1 to get an odd number. Now, if you'd like to explain that in your answer, you can do. But from what I've looked at of mark schemes, it seems to imply that this is enough to show that this is an odd number. I think that it's probably worth giving a little bit of an extra sentence. And so that extra sentence would be a number multiplied by 2 plus 1 is going to be an odd number. So there is a proof that the product of two odd numbers is odd. Now, I've got some other bits here that I wanted to talk about because we used some language about different odd numbers there. And we used the language of 2n plus 1 and 2m plus 1. And that's because I wanted to have two different numbers here. It's important we try and add in these phrases where they are integers as well. OK. Um, sometimes they use n and m, but sometimes they use letters like k, p, Q. Those are the kinds of letters that you might come across when doing this. So consecutive odd numbers. The word consecutive just means um, like next to each other. So consecutive odd numbers might be things like 11 and 13 or 17 and 19. So you can think about why that would work, because these two numbers that we have here would be consecutive because you've got an even number minus one and an even number plus one, which is going to give you two odd numbers. People in my class said, well, could I do 2n plus one and could I also do 2n plus three? Yes, these two numbers are also odd and consecutive. It just tends to be this is the way we use it here. The proof will still work. Uh, you'll just be using some uh, ones and threes rather than ones and minus ones. You can then see for the next bit, even numbers are just going to be 2n and 2m. And consecutive even numbers would be 2n and 2n plus 2. You could also do 2n plus 4 if you wanted the next one. I then got that a is a factor of b. 
So just think about carefully how that would be positioned. You would say that B is equal to N A, where N is an integer, because you would have that A multiplied by N is giving you B. Now this one I want to spend a little bit more time thinking about here. I want to talk about what a rational number actually is. So a rational number can be written as a fraction like a over b and it's where a and b are integers and have a highest common factor of one. In other words it is a fraction in its lowest terms. So some examples of rational numbers could be things like a half, a third, 17, because remember 17 could be written as 17 over 1. It could even be things like minus 12, because that could be written as minus 12 over 1. Or it could be things like uh, 0.4 recurring, because we know that 0.4 recurring is 4 over 9. So rational numbers can be written as fractions. And the reason that it's called a rational number is because of that bit ratio at the beginning. It just means that you can write this number of a ratio of two other numbers. Now, that means that we're going to have some numbers that are irrational numbers and I thought I'd just write down an example of some few different irrational numbers. The most famous ones are pi, e and root 2 but of course you can have some other irrational numbers like 3 plus pi or 1 plus root 2 over 3. These are examples of numbers that you can't write in fractional form and they've just got some irrational numbers as part of them. OK, so let's try and do some proof questions again as we continue here. This time it says prove that the distance the difference between the squares of any two consecutive integers is equal to the sum of these two integers. So I'm going to let our consecutive integers be n and n plus 1. So the difference between the squares of their consecutive integers will be so we have n plus 1 squared minus n squared. That's because we're doing the difference. We're subtracting them between their squares. And I'm actually going to work that out. So it would be n squared plus 2n plus 1 minus n squared, which is equal to 2n plus 1. And we want to see, is this equal to the sum of these two integers? And 2n plus 1 is the sum of n plus 1 and n. So we have proven the statement. And that's all you need to do. You'll find yourself writing out a few more sentences in these kinds of questions as you um, explain yourself. And that's good. We're looking to be able to use sentences to explain ourselves because proof is all about communication. OK, so I'm going to have a look at a couple of other kinds of things for proof by deduction here. This is one that pops up quite a lot in quadratics and the exam tip here, as I've said, this is quite a common last part question. So we want to prove that x squared plus 4x plus 5 is positive for all values of x. And so the little trick that we're going to use here is we are going to use completing the square. So I'm going to perform an operation of completing the square on x squared plus 4x plus 5, which is going to be x plus 2 squared minus 4 plus 5, which is plus 1. Now, we know something, and it's this bit that I've got over here. Anything squared is at least 0, and this is formally known as the trivial inequality. So this bit here, the x plus 2 squared, we know that it must be greater than or equal to 0. Okay? If you think about that, any time you square a number, it is going to be 0, if it's 0 squared, or it's going to be a positive number. So we can say that x plus 2 squared is greater than 0. Hence, we could say that x plus 2 squared plus 1 is actually greater than or equal to 1. So x squared plus 4x plus 5 is positive for all values of x. And that's all you need to do to show this. Completing the square to show that something is positive is a really, really useful trick. OK, so we've got one more question here, and it says, prove that the sum of the squares of two consecutive odd numbers is two more than a multiple of eight. So two consecutive odd numbers. Let's just talk about these two consecutive odd numbers. We looked at these earlier on, the two consecutive odd numbers. We could call them 2n plus 1 and 2n plus 3. But if you remember, I said the better way of doing this is going to be 2n minus 1 and 2n plus 1. 
So I'm going to do the sum of their squares. I'm going to do 2n minus 1 squared plus 2n plus 1 squared. And I'm going to expand those brackets. So I get 4n squared minus 4n plus 1 plus 4n squared plus 4n plus 1. You'll notice the minus 4n and the 4n cancel out. So what we get left with is 8n squared plus 2. Now, as I said before, this is enough in the mark scheme to show that it is 2 more than a multiple of 8. But the reason it is 2 more than a multiple of 8 is because you've got some number being multiplied by 8. So this bit here is a multiple of 8. And this bit here means it is 2 more than a multiple of 8. So you don't necessarily need to explain this from what I've seen in the mark schemes, but I do think that's a useful thing to do. So we can say, hence, we have proven, and it's always important to have this conclusion statement, that the sum of the squares of two consecutive odds is two more than a multiple of eight. Okay, we're gonna try just one last bit here and it's a bit of a warning. Be warned, proof by deduction requires you to start from known facts and end up at the conclusion. It is not acceptable to start with the conclusion and verify that it works because then you're assuming the thing that you are trying to prove. So if they're asking you to prove that something is true, you can't assume that it is true in order to prove it because you're then building your assumptions on something that hasn't been proved yet. So there's a bit of a flaw in that logic there. So for example, this one asks us to prove that if three consecutive integers are the side of a right angled triangle, they must be three, four, and five. So an incorrect proof would be to say, well, three squared, let's just first of all say using Pythagoras, this is an incorrect proof. We could say that three squared plus four squared is 9 plus 16, which is 25, which is 5 squared. But that's not actually going to be a proof because you're using the thing that you're trying to prove to be able to answer it. So we're going to try and do the correct proof instead. So I'm going to draw a triangle, and it's going to be a right angle triangle, and I want there to be three consecutive integers. Now my three consecutive integers I'm going to use, I could use x, x plus 1, and I could use x plus 2, I think I'll probably use those ones, or you could use x minus 1, x, and x plus 1. It doesn't really matter as long as you've got them as three consecutive ones. So I'm going to put x, x plus 1, and x plus 2. x plus 2 has obviously got to be the longest one because it's the hypotenuse of the triangle. So I'm now going to say, using Pythagoras, we get that x squared plus x plus 1 squared is equal to x plus 2 squared. And we're going to hope that we get the answers for 3, 4, 5 for this one. So we have x squared plus x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals x squared plus 4x plus 4. So it looks like I can do some subtractions from both sides here. Looks like I can take away x squared from both sides of the equation. And then I'm going to do some other subtracting bits that I've got. So I'm going to do the x squared. I'm going to do 2x minus 4x, which is minus 2x, and 1 minus 4, which is minus 3. And then I'm going to solve this equation so that I have x minus 3 and x plus 1. So here we have either x equals 3 or x equals minus 1. But you can't have negative lengths. Hence, if x is 3, the side lengths must be 3, 4, and 5. And the reason it needs to be 3, 4, and 5, so we have tannoys at school if you can hear that in the background. Um, the reason it has to be 3, 4, and 5 is because if x is 3, x plus 1 would be 4, and x plus 2 would be 5. 
So that's the correct proof of this, that if there are three consecutive integers, the only options are three, four, and five, and we've shown that using algebra here. Now, quick bit of uh, warning about exercise 7D. I don't think it's a very good exercise. I think most of the exercise is actually just doing like algebraic manipulation. It doesn't actually seem to reflect what the exam questions are like. So the only ones I've asked my students to have a look at are just question one and question nine from exercise 7D. I think you'll benefit more from having a look at some of my exam questions that are going to be later on in this playlist.